a rather pathetic statement and pure conceit. Does God have any special current care or provision for America? I would say that if there has been that, it has preceded our day and our generation. And we are still fortunate people because of that, but our country, country needs saving now. It does need saving. We need to pray. And to think that God, that this is really truthful, is that God, God takes care of babies and drunks and the United States of America and by nobody else. What foolishness. What foolishness that there's something special regarding the other things too. Please conceit. We need to see our trouble. We need to pray for our country. Number five, prayer is meant to be glorious. It's meant to be wonderful. We think in our humdrum lives, sometimes as believers in our, even our local church, and our, our attendance, and, and, and the, our relationship to the Bible, our relationship to a prayer life. Now, this is, doesn't have much life or vigor in it. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, and we, we get away from it. We, we don't allow ourselves much of that in our experience. Our prayer life, our experience in our church is meant to be of joy and glorious for the sake of our God. Being a Christian and now part of the great family of God is meant to consist of going in our Father's mansion from room to room, admiring His creation, relishing the beauty and splendor of it all. Joy. So important. Number six, all of our hope of success in prayer must rest upon the mediation of Jesus Christ. In essence, that means that he's key and involved in it. And so that's what it's really saying in the verses just before this, verse, verse 11. Prayer, so important. I was so pleased in a couple of situations. I think in the nursing home, this happened, and then counseling somebody individually. In each case, some oldster at the nursing home, and somebody far younger, I think, in counseling this week. Each of them used, not knowing the other, they used John 14, 6. You know that one. Jesus says there, doesn't he? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. See, uh, I'm getting now to our verse a little bit more. Verse 12 uses the word access. Access. How do we come to these truths? Who is going to be key in our prayer life? Well, it's going to be Christ. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the one who is key since our spiritual life has turned to Christ, he's the one key in everything and certainly our prayer lives. So look at this word now in verse 12, the word boldness. Boldness, what does it mean? I have never been a bold person in my life. Are you one of these? Uh, maybe, was anybody bullied in school when you were young? I was so surprised a few years ago when Frank Peretti, a very famous Christian author, quite influential in the last 20, 30 years, wrote a whole book about how he was, his whole life had changed, and it was miserable as a boy because he was bullied. I can't remember being bullied hugely. I was big enough to take care of myself in the, the mild little public school where I went. But the truth is, we have some of us in that, that kind of a background of such pain, such agony. Why are we considered fearless? To have freedom from apprehension, to be living in an assured kind of a way. That's not us. That's not us normally. But you see, verse 12 is talking about something we should aspire to and recognize as our right as children of God now. There should be a certain amount of boldness now in us. We are not bold just because we're New Yorkers. We're not bold because we're, say, more in control of our lives than other people. We are, as believers, it, People of, of boldness because of Jesus Christ. And to be bold is to be not hesitant, not doubtful, not uncertain. It is the exact opposite of all that indicates weakness, strength, power. I use the word power in the title of this message. God has given us boldness. Last night, I was listening. I usually often listen to music when I'm 
studying, and last night I picked out some old LP records. My wife is threatening to sell them if I die before her, and she thinks there's lots of money in them. You're just look them up on, the, on Google and find a place and they'll buy your records. Anyways, I was working away last night and I picked out a couple of my old Neil Diamond records. I thought I listened to Neil Diamond my whole life. I picked out a record that had Cherry Cherry, um, The Long Way Home, Solitary Man, a few other great ones. And I looked at the record. The record had a little bit, I don't even look for the date. It said 1971. 40 years ago, these were already hits. How many years has he been saying? What's going on there? I've got to admit, in some of the lyrics, some of the words, some of the intentionality, it's teenage or young 20s kind of pushy romance, boldness, yeah. We all sort of hooked to love Neil Diamond on his rhythms and his words and etc. But uh, I thought again, I'm not a bold person. Why do I like this music? Well, I turn out to do. I'm not a bold person. But I can have a certain amount of boldness in my life regarding things spiritual, for sure. Regarding God, for sure. Regarding prayer, certainly this verse increases the thought and it motivates us to think, where is the boldness in my prayer life? And our lives in prayer should be full of a little more boldness. Why? is pleased as we come boldly before him. Did you see that? In Exodus, when we read the scripture this morning regarding, regarding Moses and his God. God, at one place, by the way, the Pentateuch, it says that Moses was meek beyond all men. Interesting verse. Then you read what he says to God in what we now have as Exodus chapter 33. And there is meek, meekness itself, Moses, standing up and complaining. He gets a response from God, too. Then he complains some more. He's revealing his heart. What is he doing? He's praying. He's coming before God, and he's frankly unloading his heart. Boldness is a part 
of what we ought to be in relationship to our God. We can approach Him, we can pray to Him, and He welcomes it. Acts 4, verse 13 is a very interesting verse about two men who were going to be quite exalted, really, but were really very humble at this point. Acts 4, verse 13, listen about Peter and John. Now when they, the Pharisees, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, that's us, they were just like us, ignorant and unlearned, as they saw them and watched them. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Unquote. Ordinary men who were bold without reason in man's eyes. And clearly the difference was Jesus. Hebrews 10, recognize this verse, Hebrews 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see, it's all keyed to Jesus. We are to be bold when it comes to prayer. Maybe we've been too hesitant. It's not, of course, that God does not already know our heart. He knows our heart, and of course He knows what we're going to say before He says it, we say it. But the truth is, He appreciates our saying it, and demands our saying it. And counts our sin as a merit and note and worthy of blessing. And so we are called to be bold for our God. Moses was frank there in Exodus before his God. Look at David for just a moment. Look at David, who of course wrote Psalm 23, Psalm 1. Look at Psalm 13 just for a minute. And to see what kind of person. David also was. Psalm 13, the first few verses. How long will you forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord. God, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. See, David, among the other insights he had in relationship to his God, was that he could be frank before his God. He could be open, and it was welcomed by my God. By the way, that's not what I want to hear, frankly. It's probably not what you want to hear from others. We are comfortable with complaint, not when we think about it. But here is God welcoming our self-revelation before Him. And sometimes, even as that is so severe from our own heart, He still in love receives it. It is real. Think about Jesus Himself in one of the most difficult to understand, I think, Scenes in his life. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Have you ever had doubts that you know what is really going on there? Have you felt those scriptures? Have you felt anything coming close to what Jesus felt in those scriptures? He is laying himself frankly and honestly before the Father. Matthew 26 is an example. 26, 36 through 44, other Gospels recorded. He is an example of boldness and confidence. Hey, in one perspective, he's our one today. We're part of the family. We have a call from God to be bold. Bold before our God. Remember, I keep remembering how in Revelation, there's insight, according to especially one of the churches, who was so non bold so wishy-washy, for the truth, or for justice, or for right, or certainly even for God, they were nothing. God says, you're so neutral, you're so lukewarm, I wish you were either hot or cold. And then in a 
Jesus. I've ignored for too long these verses that speak about boldness. Also, we ignore about access. The next word is access. On track. Going in. Welcomed in. Many have experienced being the last one chosen for a sports activity. I'm accepted. Slowly accepted. Think about how many have attempted to join the same club and been refused. Or to join a co-op and have been refused. Think about rejection. Think about the closed door, the slammed shut door. But think about God. Forget the club membership. With God, we have this encouragement that all the barriers are gone. That there is now finally acceptability. There is access. A chance to get big backstage with the biggest shot of all. Almighty God. It's a means of entry that cannot be denied. How rich we are today. I'm reminded in the Old Testament about how God commanded the building of an ark. Actually, a piece of furniture. Careful. Careful with it. Remember, one, as it was being transported at one time, was so careless as to touch that ark as it was being transported. Apparently deciding that God couldn't take care of his own ark, or that he couldn't keep that, that, that ark steady as it was being transported without his vital help. So he touched to steady the ark, and he was cut down dead. Careless and of some pride, perhaps, in doing such a thing. A temple was built by David and Solomon. Rooms to the glory of the Lord. Every stone of dedication to God. One room particularly made so that but one would enter it. And that one, a special room, a high priest, entering once a year. 